I'm back from Sacramento with all the details on the California Democratic Convention from this weekend. The president headed to the Middle East for his first foreign trip. And our legal analyst and the former U.S. Senate staffer Roger Wolfson is back to discuss recent Supreme Court rulings and the latest on the Trump-Russia probe. It's Tuesday, May 23rd. Welcome to Political Culture. You're tuned into Black Hollywood Live, Political Culture. I think that was the first time that we got through the whole... Without a major without flow? Without a major flow. It's because we got somebody watching us. I love it. That was good. Maybe welcome we need guys. that kind of pressure every we time. We do. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. Uh, I'm your host, Drexel Hurd. You can follow me on Twitter at Drexel. I'm actually not used to it being this quiet without the show's music playing above my head. Oh, <laughs> I kind of like it. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Drexel Hurd. I'm Chelsea Galicia. Follow me at Chelsea Galicia. And you can follow After Buzz TV at After Buzz TV. And uh, leave your comments in uh, the comment section below. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today, and uh, we are glad to have Roger back in the studio. How was your weekend? Pretty good. Yeah. Pretty busy. I'm even trying to imagine what it all was. It feels like it was already months ago. I feel, I mean, I know we talk about it like every week, but I feel like we have been, we're only 122 days into this presidency, and I feel like we've been at least two years into this presidency. I know. Are we, maybe because we're, are we graying? Are we aging? No, no, because no. Because of... Beige no. don't age. And black um. don't crack. No, we're not going on that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's good to know. I feel better already. A um, couple of quick things. Got a lot of breaking news happening. Uh, shout out to Manchester and, Ariana Gra uh, and the Ariana Grande. Manchester at the Ariana Grande concert last night. Uh, 22 confirmed dead people, over 50 people injured. Uh, the suspect was identified and he killed himself. Yeah, suicide bomber. Suicide 22 bomber. 22-year-old. Yep. And uh, ISIS claimed response. ISIS. What is going on here? Wow. That was definitely not... ISIS and Russia have taken over this show. Um, what is happening right now? <laughs> um, you can welcome to, to the jungle. I don't know. Uh, I love that we are live and this is happening right now. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. That happened. That I don't didn't know. happen. Um, and so ISIS claims responsibility, which is crazy because ISIS there, always it, claims responsibility. Yeah, for there's no evidence that there is any ISIS link. Yeah, there's never. They, that, that, there's never oh, any evidence. Okay, that you all did not hear what we were yeah, just flooded we with. We heard a whole Thank like you. a concert concert in our head. It, unfortunately, it was not the Ariana Grande concert. Um, yeah, so he ended up killing himself and. Uh, Theresa May's come out with a statement, so they've already raised the, the threat level uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, to critical. To critical, expecting another attack. So Imminently. Um, That's horrifying. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so be on the, keep your eyes peeled on that, because there's a lot of people that are still missing. Uh, and then, of course, a shout out to uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins III, who was murdered over the weekend. He was a, he had just got commissioned uh, from Bowie State, and they had their graduation today, and his dad actually um, got his diploma for him. Oh. He was murdered standing outside uh, uh, waiting for an Uber. So, yeah, so his graduation was today. Uh, the biggest, not the biggest news, but the most shocking news that happened today that I don't think has ever happened as, as long as I've ever been alive or ever been watching the news is that Fox News retracted a story today. Well, yes, sort of, kind of. Yes, sort of, kind of. I mean, they retracted a story that Hannity was promoting about Seth, Seth Rich, Rich right. the DNC staffer who was killed, shot in the back last summer. Right. Uh, Hannity has been putting out this theory that he was killed by the DNC itself for leaking. Literally, Debbie Wasserman Schultz pulled the trigger. Herself. Well, I, I hadn't heard that level of kidding. conspiracy, but that the DNC, um, yeah, had him killed because he was the actual leak to the, the source for WikiLeaks rather than Russia. Right. And Fox News for the first time, well, Rich. it was Fox News and Fox, but Hannity himself was like, I'm not Fox News. I'm not FoxNews.com, so that doesn't speak for me. Right. So, yeah, so obviously Sean Hannity is on his own... World. world. He's been, well, he's been in his own world for a while because, like, literally, there's nobody left over at Fox News, to be honest. I mean, there's new, there's. That's, that's true. But I do, and, and like, this is going to be come out of left field for you. The Hannity story is 
is interesting, not just because, you know, the family has asked him to knock it off with this conspiracy thing, but I think that there is something bizarre about this story. The current theory is that he was killed in a botched robbery. Yet That's no, not, well, that, no, yes. nothing was taken from him. Right. He wasn't like in a high crime area, as far as I understand. Yeah, but and that there we is, keep thinking that there's nothing high crime around these days and everything's high crime. Okay, that's valid. <laughs> but just the circumstances around it look pretty odd. And I'm not, but it makes more sense if we're gonna go conspiracy theory that the somebody in the Republican Party would have him killed so that he couldn't ever come out tell and the story. testify against right. them rather than having it be from the DNC. Because then once he gets subpoenaed, he's gotta tell everything. Yeah, so so maybe Hannity's like correct that it's a conspiracy theory, but the wrong altogether. But, but I don't want to be peddling but, any theories but right as now. They always say, if if the the Democrats and and Hillary Clinton and those guys were going to be killing anybody, Anthony Weiner would have been gone a long time ago. Right? Oh, Jesus, <laughs> and and he's still rocking, he's still kicking. Um, the other big thing that came out today... I don't even know what to do with that. <laughs> was, <laughs> Just going to keep quiet. Uh, Donald Trump released... Uh, the White House released the budget today, uh, calling for $1.4 trillion, a $1.4 trillion reduction of the federal budget over a decade, reducing funding for Medicaid, uh, children's health insurance, uh, food stamps, and more. And we're going to talk a little bit... Of, we're going to talk more in-depth about that uh, on next week's show because... I could go so on. far into the madness that was included into that budget, like the weaving of this story. It's a, a fantasy story yeah. that uh, really deserves a lot you of mean, attention, uh, more than the numbers. It? They didn't call it a budget. They called it welfare reform. I mean, there was just... I can't. I, if we get started, I probably won't stop yeah. until they tell so us that we're week, running out of time. Check this space. Next week, we're going to talk about the budget because the... In uh, depth. And not just the numbers, because the numbers themselves can be a little boring, but it's the, the narrative that was weaved in to the budget that was really fascinating. Right. Narrative, fantasy. I should probably stick with one word. I think fantasy. I just, just the way that the author of that budget sees the world is completely different from the one that you and I... Oh, inhabit. Mick, Mick Mulvaney? Mick, Mick Mulvaney? Wait, did he actually write it? Oh, he's the OMB director. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, I heard him talking about it today, defending it as though it was the most noble thing since the Constitution itself. Well, I mean, if you're doing keg stands uh, talking about taking away, you know, health care and, and Medicaid, then yeah. I mean, that's right in line with what Paul Ryan wants anyway, so... I, it's it's the, it's, the it's just I blah, 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 blah. okay yeah, yeah so, we'll save so that next for next week, week. Next week the uh, the um, the CBO score is out tomorrow uh, Wednesday uh, on Obama on uh, the ACHA so we'll have those numbers as well as the budget numbers next week because it all goes together. together yeah um, but it's bad I mean just, just that's the sneak preview what has of the not budget been bad, though the uh, you, mm, okay it was worse than I was expecting. Wait till those Obama. Wait till those healthcare numbers come out. Then it's going to be sure. even worse tomorrow. Um, did you get a chance to see the president uh, and the first lady descend the stairs in Saudi Arabia over the weekend? I, she I did. Slap that hand away. I did. I was. I. I tried not to spend too much time on that because that was. Like, I just liked the loop. Yeah, it was like a little. Yeah. I thought it was a high five. No, and then it wasn't a, a high, high five anymore. Trexel, a high five goes like no, this. No, you know, you know, you know, you're just like, yeah, give me a high mm. five, you know, maybe. Mm. But the, but I thought it was, and then I gave the I gave them the bit. I said, how could the White House spin this story if it came out, or they just don't talk about it at all? Of course, Pete Sousa, who's you know Obama's um, photographer, uh, posted a photo today of the Obamas holding hands. <laughs> He's been trolling this White House for so long. Um, so yeah, so the president's on a nine-day foreign trip. First one, first president ever to go from, oh geez, where did he start? Saudi Arabia. Thank you, from, to fly from Saudi Arabia to Israel, directly. What did we say, Riyadh? Riyadh. Riyadh, Riyad, Saudi Arabia, and then uh, that was over the weekend. So he sounded like a tame person with a message. Yes, and I, you know, of course over the weekend we heard, it happens every time that he gives a speech on a teleprompter, like, you know, wow, the president gave a presidential speech. Well, of course he did. If he can't read, anybody who can read can yeah. give a presidential speech. Yeah. I don't, I, blah, blah, blah. here's my thing. He was like, oh, we're not going to tell you how to live. 
We're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to tell you how to pray, how to, uh, your, your religion. Nothing on human rights is basically what he's saying. We're not going to tell you anything about that. But you all better get together on this ISIS thing and drive them out. Drive them out of your communities. Drive them out of your church. Drive them out. Drive them into obliteration. Right. And, and he did a really great job, which is kind of what he does a good job of in general, creating a narrative around this. You know, this isn't about religion. This isn't about different f uh, factions of groups. This is about good versus evil. Right. And that is a really is, simplistic is, story for everybody to get around. Which is similar to what George Bush did, George W. Bush, with his axis of evil. So that's not far off from where Republicans like to spin their narrative. And, and you know, and it's not, it's not a, a bad one, except that you, when it's just, it's not that simple, good versus evil. Right. Because if you just see it as good versus evil, then you just want to, you'll just try to annihilate them, but you're not really stopping the cause for why they arose in the first place. Right, which of course this president's not going to ever understand because that would require him to understand the back history, Shia, Sunni, you know, any, any religious feud uh, he would have to understand. And, and of course he does not quite grasp that uh, piece of it, which, which, which you could see from campaign Trump to this last speech, Trump, the, you know, Stephen Miller wrote this speech. Uh, Stephen Miller, who's the like alt right speech writer, senior policy advisor of the White House, he wrote this speech and it had a completely different tone as to where they wanted to go when they were, were whereas candidate Trump would attack the Muslim religion, right. they changed the term to radical Islamist. Terrorists, but they didn't terrorism. use that term in front of them. He act the in the script. It said radical Islamist terrorism. He accidentally said radical Islamic terrorism, which has a different meaning altogether to the audience. Um, but then the White House came back and said instead of like going forward with what he said and said you know instead of doing that they actually came back and said he was exhausted. Oh. And he had made a mistake. Oh no! And then that's what had happened. And I remember. I didn't. That's that's so funny because you know he the whole campaign was like I've got the stamina, the right. best stamina. Right. So yeah. So now you've got this exhausted president who's on this nine day trip. Um, you know he's still in Saudi Arabia. He's got this. He signs, first of all, he signs his arms deal. Yeah, which is not, like, with all the crap that's been going on, it's been like this teeny tiny little story, but is the one that started, I think, my nausea a couple of days ago. $110 billion. Over 10 years, it's a deal worth $350 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but that's like about half of the discretionary uh, spending budget for the military that right. Trump has proposed. Anyways. It's a lot of freaking money, and more than the money, that's a lot of weapons. Right. A lot of weapons to go to that part of the world. That you don't know what's going to happen to them once they get there. Which, where we're trying to stamp out terrorism, and, you know, to send, Saudi Arabia, does nobody remember 9-11? Yeah, and that, that, that's, that's, what, that's what's so interesting about how this has escaped the conversation over the past couple of days since this arms deal, which is we know based on intelligence that Saudi Arabia, well, obviously we're not going to say that. The United States, I don't think, is ever going to say that Saudi Arabia. But it's just because we like them more than Iran. That's that's why. And I'm going to assume so and, and that they have a lot of, I mean, they're the richest, one of the richest countries in the world. I mean, Iran's just not, you know, so, um, I mean, you know, and we'll, this we're is going to come back to bite us. Yeah, uh, of course it is. I mean, but it came back to bite us on 9-11. It came back, it came back yeah. to bite us in the 90s. And then you have like here, this. you added all the, um, you know, military industrial complex whose stock prices went up. I mean, I just may vomit right here. So, then my, on so, the show. Then, my, so then my question it's on terrible. that is, so we get, so basically there's a $110 billion deal. Our defense contractors get a chance to build those weapons um, ship them out. I, w I am fascinated that the White House did not spin this as a job related job building. But no, but thing. I mean, they're, they're constantly, I don't think that industry was one where jobs were lacking. 
but what I'm saying is that they could say that they help they they're gonna they're gonna use that 110 billion dollars to to build more jobs. I think in they these... know better than to try and make this look good because it's just inviting criticism. I mean, did you of see like, the photo though? I mean, which, the one of them. I mean, it, I mean, this was a big deal. It wasn't like they did it in some back room. I think people like the optics of, oh, look at two world leaders signing something together. That part looks right. good. But when you try and defend the substance of the deal right. and try and make it sound better than it is, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he was stupid enough to do that. But you don't want to draw attention to this. Yeah, I'd be interested in knowing, I, I, in knowing which states, which senator, which state houses oh, you know, these... Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, you, Raytheon, uh, Northrop. I, then I might have some breaking news for you. California. Oh, we, I'm sure. We actually benefit a lot. We have. Um, Do we have Lockheed? Northrop Grubman. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Lockheed. Uh, I'm sure Raytheon has. Raytheon. Ha, has. Um, a manufacturing. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, with this time to out California a little bit as which to I, not which, being the progressive leader. Which is why you probably didn't hear anything from uh, Diane Feinstein and Kamala Harris over the weekend. Yeah. Um, but you know, so uh, yeah, so I, I'm inter I'm, I'm surprised they just didn't spin it that way. Um, if if it, but it just didn't come up as a controversial thing. And I don't know from how. not a single person, not a single, not not even not even. Tulsi Gabbard. Gabbard. No, not I'm, even, I can't believe that. Not I said even that Bernie without. Sanders. Not nobody no, said a I, word. Mm, mm. I mean, I, mean, I haven't. If I, haven't I seen would it. have known that that was going to be called out, I would have done my homework because you know me. I need to defend the man when he, defense. Well, is I just, too. I just meant like there has been no constant talk about it. Nobody's making a big deal about it. So, and it's certainly not coming from. Well, Democrats I do right not now. stipulate to nobody's making a big deal out of it, but I would agree that we're not making a big, big enough, enough deal. deal about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the arms deal happened. Another deal happened at the same time. Wait, hold on. Can we, Trump, you know, negotiating deals. I mean, was, do we think like he, he's a good negotiator? Because no. this, has I'm sure it's been something that's been going on for a long time. The Trump administration just signing off on it now. Ugh. Okay, um, what was the other one? The other big deal was Ivanka Trump. Oh, please. For her foundation. She got a very nice... Um, hundred million? Hundred million dollars for her non-Clinton Foundation-esque foundation. I'm sure a lot of that she negotiated people will be... Over the weekend. Helped. Yes. Right. Um, that was sarcasm in case it didn't come across clearly. Um, and then, yeah, so that happened over the weekend. So Ivanka and, and, and Jared Kushner, who's not under investigation but is under investigation, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is over there. And then they fly over to Israel, to Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Bethlehem this morning. Uh, there was a nice photo of the president at the Western Wall. I mean, it seemed like he was having an emotional moment almost. My favorite over the weekend was seeing people, <laughs> seeing the meme where people said that he was putting the electoral map into the, <laughs> <laughs> to the wall. <laughs> I mean, he was standing like, there, yeah. like, look, look, like, look. If you look at that photo, he's just he's just putting that electoral college map right in. I won. Uh, there was another one where he's like whispering to the wall. I mean, he was having a moment with the wall, and I don't know if that was out of like sincere respect or just, you know, he knew the eyes were on him and he knew it would make him. Or he could have been saying. I mean, I guess anything thing is for optics. One day we're gonna have a wall just like you. Oh. That's funny. <laughs> he could be saying that. Really he could just be whispering that into wait, waiting to hear the echo back from the hole in the wall. Right. Um, the wall, because that's in the budget. Yeah. Um, in Israel, with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he gave a press conference. Uh, he started this press conference out weird. Like, I read this article today on Politico. It's actually on Politico right now. That said, the headline is, Trump, America's most honest president. Whoa. Yes. Because he doesn't know when to not say things. But uh, I don't think that that necessarily makes him honest. I just think that he says he lies about things and then says them off the cuff. So it's it's not that it's honest. It's that it's authentic. authentic but he's sounded. authentic. He's like authentically, authentically wrong. lying. Yeah. Not wrong. <laughs> authentically lying. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so he, he's in this, he's in this standing next to Benjamin Netanyahu and he gets this question from a reporter where he says, uh, where the reporter asks something about Trump, Russia, collusion, whatever, whatever. Oh no, just about the, the Russia, Russians coming into the White House and 
Who did you get the intelligence from? With that meeting with Kislyak, with Kislyak and, and the other guy whose and, name and I can't remember. And all the other spies and uh, Foxy Cleopatra. <laughs> Austin Powers. And he I love says, how we keep things very serious and accurate on this and, show. Um, and so he said, oh, I wasn't the one who told told them that the intelligence came from Israel. Right. I never used the I word I never used the name. word Israel. Yeah. And, Thank and, you, President, for confirming and, Exactly. And did you see Benjamin Netanyahu's source. face? No, I looked. He was like, <laughs> like, like confused. Like, why would you say that? Because he, nobody had accused him of telling the Russians that it was Israel. He just, we're not supposed to tell them what the information was because it would have outed them. So now we just sort of outed them double time. Right. Great. I mean, he's, he's kind of an idiot. I mean, I know we don't use that word very often, but he's a little nitty, he's a little idiot. Um, rest of the trip, so yeah, so that's where he is today. He's days two through four are in Israel and the West Bank. Uh, days five and six are in Rome, the Vatican, and Italy. Hopefully the Pope will do something. Um, <laughs> day seven, he's in Brussels, Brussels, Brussels in Belgium. And days eight and nine, he is uh, going to get a lot of wine in Italy. Uh, but in the middle... I don't, he doesn't drink. Oh, yeah. Well, somebody's going to be drinking. Probably Melania. Mm. Um, and probably Jared Kushner before he gets back and touches down and gets arrested. Um, <laughs> Ooh, ooh, is this a prediction? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, Michael Flynn, you know, I told you Michael Flynn's going to jail. Jared Kushner might well, be. Well, you think Jared Kushner may go the way of Flynn? I don't this? You know, when they say, when there's smoke, there's fire. And there's a lot of smoke coming from Kush Tower. Kush Tower. Okay. Um, That's funny. Kush, Kush, I, Kush. Oh, I just got that. Very funny. <laughs> well done. Um, so, yeah, the other foreign trip that's happening this week is uh, President Obama's going to be in Germany with oh. Angela Merkel. Oh. Yep. So we're going to we're going to talk briefly about that next week because he is starting his 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 reemergence and his civic engagement uh, tour. He's going to hmm. be doing that. Um, other news back home. We've got a couple things happening. Last week, North Carolina. Now, I'm from North Carolina. I went to college in North Carolina. Yeah. Shall and we bring in our, our, our guest, our, our legal guests. expert? Yeah. Hey, Roger Wilson. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Very well. Welcome back to the show. It's been fun just listening to the two of you. You guys are terrific. <laughs> Thanks. Um, glad to have you back. we got a lot to talk about. So we're, we're going we're gonna to jump right into North Carolina because uh, there were some Supreme Court rulings uh, last week on voter ID. Indeed, yeah. And uh, Cooper versus Harris came down yesterday. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by any of these rulings? Actually, let's start with the voter ID because that was an easy one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, say, that, was I that. say that was an easy one because the court didn't have to rule on anything. They just did not take the case. Right. They let the lower courts kind of did, like keep the ruling and, yes. and do their thing. Exactly. Uh, and that one came out first, so it was a little bit more um, it was a little bit more mysterious because we don't know really how any of the individual justices feel about anything because they just didn't. They just decided not to hear it. Right. So it, it's hard to take that. It's good news for those of us who are liberals because we really believe that these voter restriction laws are crazy. I mean, and really unhealthy and really bad for the country and really bad, obviously, for minority populations. So it's great that they didn't hear it, but it gave us no real inclination of what was going to happen next. Which is interesting that you say that because Cooper versus Harris, I think, gave us an indication of where they would have ruled had they gone and ruled on voter ID. Possibly, Because yeah. they are somewhat similar in terms of being racially discriminatory cases. Yeah, exactly. yeah, the difference, though, is Clarence Thomas, I don't know if he would have ruled against the voter ID law. And that's the, that's the difference you know in who the I was gerrymandering case. And, and I know we talk about, you know, we talk about Justice Kennedy being a swing vote a lot. Like, Kennedy being on the, on the minority side in this Cooper versus Harris and, Cl and Thomas being on the majority side, like that's some, that's some, I mean, we are living in some weird times. Absolutely. This is a weird, I don't know if that's ever happened before. Maybe he's, maybe he feels like he's on his way out and he's got to make up for a lot of stuff. Thomas. Who? Thomas. He's grown a conscience? N no. Maybe he's, maybe. Well, actually, this is, you know, my under, my, following of Clarence Thomas is filled with a lot of um, frustration and a measure of disgust. Uh, but he, when it comes to racial issues, he tries to, he pretends or at least claims to be racially blind in terms of his decisions. Right. This one, you could make the connection between his previous decisions and this particular 
case. Now, which is what's so scary about it. When you first look at it, when I first saw the numbers, it was a five to three vote. Right. I thought, oh my God, maybe things are great. And then I just took another step in. First of all, um, Gorsuch recused himself because he hadn't, well, he didn't recuse himself. He hadn't mm -hmm. been part of the oral right. arguments. He couldn't rule. Um, so then you've really got, you know, five, four, and it really comes down to Thomas. Now, Thomas really, you know, in terms of his history of trying to be racially blind in terms of his decisions, he's actually done that in part because so many cases that have come before him, if he didn't do, if he wasn't, quote, racially blind, it wouldn't enable him to vote against black people. In this situation, it's one of the only times where he really felt like he was kind of boxed in. You know, and, and, and you can see this in Elena Kagan's argument because Elena Kagan really wrote it very, very cagely. She's an incredibly smart person. And what she's really trying to do is base, it, it was insert into this whole argument, this principle of it almost doesn't matter what you are trying to do. It just matters what the result is. Mm -hmm. So if you are trying, you know, um, what the Republicans say and what the conservatives are saying is they were trying to create districts that were safe for, you know, where, where black people knew that they would have representation. Um, and then what, what <coughs> by Kagan- By shrinking got, them. Right, yes. by shrinking them, by, by blocking them, basically by creating ghettos, by, you know, right. in that sense. Um, and Kagan then go, goes and says, it doesn't, you know, something, we're not even gonna talk too much about what you're trying to accomplish, we're gonna talk about the result, mm -hmm. which is a legal principle. And the result was, you end up with um, black voters all ferried together, and it diminishes their overall impact. To the point where there's 13 districts, and the state is pretty evenly split Democrat, Republican, but 10 out of the 13 districts are like Republican right. because of the way that they've drawn the lines. And this one was focused on districts one and districts 12, which, which are, are held by AJ, a, 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 Aza Butterfield, Butterfield and Adams, I think and uh, heavily African-American districts. Actually, both of them are African-American, I'm, I'm sure, but they are very tiny uh, the, districts. Uh, this is a, you know, it seems like a little case, you know, it's, you know, North, okay, Supreme Court rules on something, that's a pretty big deal. But gerrymandering isn't some like hot, sexy topic, so I don't think that this is going to get very much attention. Right. Which but is, it is a massive and deal. Talked, and we talked about that during Trump versus Hillary, we talked about it. We've talked about it on this show before. How important to to for people to understand that you know we talk a lot about there's arguments about how President Obama led the Democrats to lose a, a thousand seats across the country. I think that there is an argument to be made that yes, from the leadership uh, at the top, there were problems structurally to make sure that Democrats held on to Democrat seats. However, on the other side of that, people forget that you know, th almost 39, I think 39 of the governor houses, the state legislature are run by Republicans who draw these state districts, who draw these districts. And Republicans have systematically been gerrymandering their districts. For years. For and years. listen, Rep Democrats are not totally no, this innocent is in this Democrats have been doing, they've been doing it since the 90s. Four to one margin though. The Republicans have four times as many um, gerrymandered districts as, as Democrats. So basically the Republicans have been better at this than the Democrats, but nobody Absolutely. should have been doing it this way in the first right. place. Or do you say better at or more effectively sleazy, at getting at their way? It. Yes. Uh, sleazier at, at, at doing Point it. taken. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, they are better at being bad. Yeah. So we shouldn't play that game. Should and or it, should not? And should this not. Is actually, this yeah. is the, the, you know, it's the good news of the month. The good news of the month is that this shows what Clarence Thomas is like when he doesn't have his, you know, his 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 buddy. Ah, oh, yeah, the Alito, the the Alito. I'm sorry, the um, Scalia. Yes, Thomas with, Scali team. with Scalia gone, um, it's actually potentially. And I, you're not. You, I've never. I haven't read about this commentary. I don't know if anybody else is saying it, but this is sort of the way I see it from behind the scenes. With uh, Scalia gone, Clarence Thomas is he's a little bit easier to manipulate. Um, he doesn't ask questions. He's not involved in the debate. Elena Kagan quite cagely again, using that word, um, she managed to craft an argument that would fall right into, that, that would make it impossible for him to be inconsistent. Oh. So she actually, what, and that's what happens when you actually, when, when, you, uh, when you're a smart justice and you're on the, you, you can actually frame things in such a way so that it boxes in one of your, uh, uh, one generally of, opponents, one of your other justices. Yeah. Um, Scalia was very good at doing it and really knew how to keep and corral Thomas. Right. With him gone, now Kagan actually has been able to sort of do a little bit of this work, and she did a beautiful job with it. Oh. 
Fascinating. Yeah. Well, that may, that's going to make June. So the reason I say it's, it's good for the month is because I, I'm, uh, Chelsea also knows this. We, um, she and I were bo both attended the Feminist Majority um, event, the 30th, re the 30th anniversary of the, fe the creation of the Feminist Majority uh, a couple of nights ago. Or was it last night? <laughs> I know, and, right? Time yeah, I know. Is Time's going so, going so fast. Yeah. And uh, Eleanor Smeal, who is the longtime head of that organization, uh, said that she had heard rumors that Justice Kennedy, well, she had, uh, that Justice Kennedy might end up retiring over that's the That's what I heard, too. Yeah. yeah. And if that's the case, then, um, you know, it really won't make a difference. I mean, first of all, another, another conservative justice comes in. You've got more people be able to corral um, Clarence Thomas and, you know. I mean, but if this, I mean, if this is the law of the land sort of right now, then there are other, as I understand it, gerrymandering cases making it Especially Texas. Yeah. And, I mean, if this is the precedent that the then the Supreme, court's then supposed never, to follow. Yeah, yeah, then everybody's gonna have to follow North Carolina. So this could change the map. This could make things more fair. I mean, this is one of the big problems in our democracy. One of the big reasons for the corruption that I'm constantly talking about is this gerrymandering. So this ruling is a, like I said, it's a big deal. And if this so becomes to, starts to affect the other states, yeah. Dear God, we may have a democracy restored. <laughs> well, look, it's, a, it's definitely a step in the and I don't want to be discouraging to you or to any of your of the people who are watching because we need to feel good about something. And I absolutely applaud what you're saying, Chelsea. My concern is that what ha that th this is not like it's a Supreme Court opinion that struck down gerrymandering. It just it just did it, it struck down specifically what's going on in North Carolina, which has very real implications in Texas. What you now need is you need people to sue on behalf of specifically the best way to do is for a Republican to sue in one of these states and saying that they're being underrepresented because of the way that, that this works. That just makes it rise that much faster. But by the time it works its way back up to the Supreme Court, we may have a different makeup of the Supreme right. Court. Mm. So uh, <clears throat> let, let's hope it's a step in the right direction. It's better news than I was expecting us to have at all you know, in these few months. But, you know, the work is not done yet. I'd be interested to see how Gorsuch mm -hmm. would have ruled if he is so, if, if he is like as black and white as he says he is, yeah. how that would have affected his. We have pretty strong, yeah, we have pretty strong indications of where he'd go and he wouldn't go the way we want. We yeah, would of course, want. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so lots and happening in North Carolina, lots of good happening in North Carolina. But we, before we leave this topic, the other gerrymandering cases, are they race related or are they just this is an unfair drawing of because it ends up with such unfairness? Because the North Carolina logic was that it relied too heavily on race and the state hadn't provided a compelling reason for that. I think from a political standpoint, I have never seen a gerrymandering case that was not about race. Hmm. Which may not be great news for the other cases unless they're all racially at, drawn. At least, at least from, a, particularly from a, because gerrymandering is all based on the census anyway, so that's, how, that's, what they, that's what they're looking at. If they were looking at... Well, they look to see, I mean, I guess they look to, to see the, the demographics that, yeah. that they, that are Republican and, and Democrat and try and squeeze the yeah. Democrats all together and have these weird shaped Republican congressional districts to try and spread out the Democrats so that the Republicans can sort of consume them right. in the district. Well, and this is this is my understanding, and I and I, I just started looking at this today, so I may be getting this mistake, and you guys can correct me because you're obviously incredibly knowledgeable about this as well, which is that I, I think that what the Republicans quote did wrong according to the Supreme Court was they used race as a substitute, you know, race equals sign partisanship. So uh, ostensibly, the Republicans were claiming, well, we were trying to just get Democratic voters in here, and we were using race because blacks vote pr primarily as Democrats. And what Elena Kagan, the way she ca caged it so that it would really box in Clarence Thomas, is that race can't equal partisanship. And of course, none of this would have happened had Republicans helped to uh, uh, make sure that the Voting Rights Act <laughs> right. was restored. And, and that's actually what they said. Race can be a factor. Like if the districts are trying to be drawn so that they address the problems or address the Voting Rights Act, the, the, the rights that are supposed to be protected in the Voting Rights Act, and race was a factor in helping to forward that, then fine. Yeah. But they said that that was what it was for, and then clearly or not. It's very, very tricky stuff. Yeah, and, no, you know, back on, you know, Back in 
in my day. North Carolina was... <laughs> what, was what was that? Back in his time in North Carolina. North Carolina was purple. I mean, it was... Well, but that's what I, I read, that it literally is purple. It's pretty evenly split. Yeah. Except when you look at the districts, then it's 10 I mean, you got Roy Republican. Cooper now, and... In and fact, this last election, 16 was supposed to be when North Carolina officially became blue. So much if you look at how the projection would have yeah. gone when Obama won in 08, yeah, absolutely. But uh, that didn't happen. Okay, so, so now do we get to hear about your weekend? No, we are moving oh, on to... Really excited to hear about We're moving that. on to what's happening with Donald Trump and the FBI. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, Michael Flynn was served with a subpoena. Mm -hmm. um, and then he decided that he didn't want to, like... He doesn't want to answer questions, answer and he doesn't questions. even want to um, produce the documents that were requested because even he's claiming that the documents he's being asked to produce would incriminate him. And since we all have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, he's invoked that right, so he will not be speaking and he will not be complying with the subpoena yes. for that reason. And and actually, so from his lawyers, they said in our May eighth, two thousand seventeen letter to the committee. We reiterated General Flynn's eagerness to give a full account of the facts and to answer the committee's questions should the circumstances permit, including assurances against unfair prosecution. So does that mean if it's fair prosecution, then they will no. uh, comply? Basically he, basically, he is trying to squeeze immunity, I'm going to assume, mm -hmm. out uh, uh, of that. So, um, Roger, what do you make of this whole subpoena thing? What, what today... Uh, so, as far as I understand, the Fifth Amendment obviously um, protects people. Um, today, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, um, uh, Richard Burr, and uh, Senator Warner have now changed that subpoena to the businesses because the Fifth Amendment does not protect businesses. What hmm. do you make of that whole, this whole th situation? Like, they're trying to box him in. Yeah, I was actually looking forward to Chelsea's reaction to this because it's one of her favorite <laughs> issues, which is are corporations people or are they not? You know, and obviously we don't think that they are, but I don't for think first and for for um, for money in politics, they've been considered to be people. Right. Um, but still, on this legal area, corporations don't say are that not out loud because people. I feel like the you know these NSA people are going to come in and they're going to be like, tell the president that corporations are people and tell the Flynn people that that's what that means. I know. I'm you sure know, they uh, all already trying to figure are it out. on that. Yeah. Well, he, so what, what it does allow them to access are documents. Now, the problem is, of course, as we know, that although corporations are not people, they're made up of people. So in terms of getting information from a corporation, you still need to go to people to get it. Right. So each one of them can individually call, plead the fifth, but if they're not um, beholden to Flynn, or if they're not named Flynn, then they, they are Flynn. It's actually Flynn Investment. It's like Flynn, and it has his name tied to I it. I know, but they have, but but he has employees that are not right. his relatives. Um, they, they, you know, or not they, his spouse. Right. They spouse, can right. be compelled, and there's other ways too to compel information out of there. They're, the Congress does have the power of contempt. You know, they, they they can't hold him in contempt if he's really, especially if he's withholding information that could be for the national interest or for national security issues. They can really be pushing on that. So there there are avenues. My only fear, my fear is that at the end of the day, these are still Republicans or answering to a Republican president or underneath the guise of a Republican president, and <laughs> I'm just afraid of going through the motions. I don't want this whole process to look, to be confused with anything other than a hamster wheel. Hmm. Right. You know, in, in, in less, in, in, until the Democrats get one of the houses of Congress, another one of the sub topics I know you guys like to talk about, until we get one of the houses, um, it's all just on the Republican side of the aisle. And they can, they, they can obfuscate, they can ignore certain things, they can fail to take advantage of opportunities here and there, and really never get to the truth. Right. Although there are some, like McCain and even Burr. Jason Chaffetz. I mean, even Richard Burr. They seem to be... I, see, I don't trust Jason Chaffetz, though. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he just... Oh, he, I didn't say anything about trust, but, but I'm just saying that the, they actually seem to be coming out to say that we want to know what, what happened. But see, Jason Chaffetz has been, like, saying it, and then he doesn't say it. And then he says it, and then he's like, but I didn't mean it. Oh. You know what I mean? It's just been kind of this back and forth with him. Well, he did a good job of fooling me because I thought he wanted to know the truth. He does in he does want to know the truth as it probably pertains to something that he thinks he can tie to Hillary Clinton. 
Oh. You know what I mean? Like, okay. that's Jason Chaffetz's end goal, but he only has a few more days left in Congress, so he's not he's not even... Like, they're trying to strip the chairmanship away from him right now, but he is now... He's waiting on Jim Comey to come and testify. And I, and I just want to make an argument to you guys and to your viewers that if we really... if Let's say you're even a Republican, and you really want an answer. You really want the truth. The best way to get there is to start talking about having a Democratic House, of House, whether it's the House of Representatives or the Senate. Whoa. That would take a Republican with a massive, well, I don't know, conscience? Or well, you know, it has happened before. There have been Democratic voters who have voted for, um, for Republicans in order to balance out the federal government. And there have been Republicans that have voted for Democrats in order to balance out the federal government. If you want the federal government to be working, if you are even – a Republican who doesn't like Trump or even a Trump voter who's disappointed in Trump, one of the best ways to get him to be more honest and more clear and more targeted is make one of the houses – make either the House or the Senate Republican or even talk about it, get us closer to it because then it becomes – of um, it becomes a political opportunity for someone like McCain or some of the moderates to be louder and more forceful about getting these answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, the Washington Post had a story. So like, there's been a lot of explosive stories. So you had the Flynn thing, and then he didn't want to come out, and then you got the president. What we talked about when he was in. Um, when he was in in Israel, and then you've got the story that came on the Washington Post that said that Trump had asked his top intelligence officials to publicly deny any collusion. Yep. Where, at what point does it, as a lawyer, and there's a lot of lawyers in the Senate and there's a lot of lawyers in the House, at what point do they have an obligation as members of the bar and former prosecutors to say that we have reached the line of obstruction of justice. Oof. That's going to be hard because they're going to, they can all be like, well, I mean, you know, it looks like obstruction, but until I know his mindset intended to deceive. Right, it's all on intent, but you can't prove intent if you don't have a trial. And that's also what I'm talking about here. Um, if you look back at, at, at um, Nixon during Watergate, you had very compelling evidence thanks to tremendous investigative journalism that Nixon had ordered the break-in of the Democratic National Committee. You had unbelievable evidence. And, and the crazy thing is that, that is so, like, if you look at Watergate and you're like, oh, they just broke into the Democratic National Com Committee? It's less than what we're talking like, about. Like, what? Yeah, it's a partisan, it's partisan hackery and it's not treason. But the, the point is that the Republicans back then, the only reason why Nixon was impeached was because the Democrats had the House. And right. he knew it was coming, so he just resigned. Right. right. The Democrats had the House, and so they, so they knew it would happen. But the, if you look back then, you know, when it was voted in committee and all this, the Republicans stayed behind him up until the last minute. Right. You know, because purely for partisan reasons. And it's going to be the same now. So until we have one of the Houses, we're, never, we're not going to have answers, and we're certainly not going to have impeachment. I mean, we can't even think about that. We can talk about all we want, but the Republicans aren't going to impeach a member of their own party. It's not going to happen. Well, let's talk about the FBI, yeah. shall we? So the so – the, so uh, there's the acting, Andrew McCabe, who's mm -hmm, the yep. acting FBI director mm -hmm. right now. Um, you've got Robert Mueller, who's a former FBI uh, the director, who That's is now special, special counsel. Mm -hmm. um, Which I got to call the president out. In his, like, witch hunt tweet, he said um, he spelled counsel wrong. Of and I he just did. cannot. Well, because he I can't can spell. C O U N C E L. Yeah, he can't spell. There's multiple ways of spelling counsel. There's counsel, there's counsel, but there's no way to spell it like that. And I just, I, I, see, no one, I just, ugh. Yeah. The, so, and the so, president can't spell counsel. I get really afraid. And, and, we, <laughs> and, we, and we talk, we've talked about this. I, we, we briefly mentioned it last week when, or two weeks ago when he fired Director Comey which was what happens when this president now has an FBI director that he gets to appoint under his wing. And there's a lot of names floating around right now. Four people have literally dropped out. Yeah. One who has not. One who has not because I believe in my, just based on how he handled Obamacare and how he pushed the Democrats not to include single payer as a thing, Joe Lieberman's name has come up. And Roger, I know you have a relationship, or had, or know of, or n know Joe. I do. You know Joe? I know Joe very well. Not yes. Joe Biden. 
But you know Joe Lieberman. I know Joe Lieberman. I, I used to work on his Senate staff. Um, he uh, was my mother's law partner, uh, he, and he drove me to my elementary school. I thought you were going to say he drove you crazy. Uh, uh, there were times that I dis- there are definitely times I disagreed with Joe. Um, I I only I worked for him for a year and then moved to work for John Kerry after him because I wanted to work for somebody more liberal and then left John Kerry for Paul Wellstone and Ted Kennedy because I wanted to be more liberal than that. Um, but Joe is someone I've known my whole life, and he's somebody I have tremendous respect for, even though I don't always agree with him. So what do you make of his Possibility. possible appointment as the FBI director? Personally, I think it's pretty great. You know, I think that there's that for whether you like him or hate him, most people agree that he's above partisanship. I mean, there's Democrats who think that he's more Republican than Democrat, and there's um, and there's a lot of Republicans who like him very much because they see him as a moderate. But if you if you really look at this day and age, if you look at the level of division that we have in this country, um, I think that you're going to be inclined to miss a little bit of Joe Lieberman because Joe Lieberman was somebody who definitely was able to be um, to work with both sides to bring people together. You know, he would take certain positions that were very liberal, and he would take positions that were conservative. It was on a case-by-case basis. Um, And I believe that one of the things that's overlooked for him is this is somebody who had a vice presidency stolen from him. There's no question about that. You know, Bush, you know, the, um, the, the presidency was stolen. There may from be some people Gordon who were, were, were not born at the time of the election that you're talking about right. who are listening to the show. We're talking about the year 2000. We're talking <laughs> about the, the fact year, that, that it Gore. It was the year 2000. <laughs> Gore and Lieberman was the, was, was, uh, was the time before this one where <laughs> Gore and Lieberman received more votes than Bush uh, and Cheney. Um, and then it came down to one state, it came down to Florida, and there was a recount in Florida, and there were so many shenanigans in that state um, that were completely unethical, and so many blacks were kept from voting up until the last minute. There's just no question that the election was stolen. Right. Um, and yet, even though Joe Lieberman could have been vice president, even though he could have been the first Jewish vice president in history, and even though theoretically in his mind he would have every reason to believe I'm going to be vice president for eight years and then I should be Barack Obama. You know, I should have been the, 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 you know, the next president. He was able to come around and support many of the policies of George Bush. Right. Now, the, Repub- the Democrats hated him for it because they didn't want Bush to be um, treated with respect any more than I want Donald Trump to be treated with respect. I mean, I would treat him as respect as a president but not as a politician or a human being because he doesn't deserve it. Either way. For Joe Lieberman, having had his, his vice presidency and his potential presidency stolen by George Bush and Dick Cheney, for him to be able to stand up there and agree with them on anything shows, to me, tremendous strength of character. I don't have that strength but of then character. My, but then my question is not necessarily so, – so you, two of the four people who were considered for FBI were both politicians. Mm-hmm. Well, three of the four. Two of them have dropped out. Do you think that the FBI director should be a politician? Somebody who's run Eric, campaigns yeah. and Eric rather Holder, than Eric Holder wasn't a politician. Loretta Lynch. I mean, I'm sorry, attorney, I'm sorry attorney general. I'm sorry. Uh, Mueller wasn't a politician. Like these people were, in the law, past enforcement were law enforcement prosecutors. People. What makes Joe Lieberman? Joe Lieberman does not come from law enforcement, as far as I understand. Joe Lieberman was attorney general of the state of Connecticut. But does that make you a? I mean, He's a state's lawyer, you know, he, and, and, and there's a lot of cases that were, you know, Connecticut versus some individual. They were prosecutorial in nature. Um, he's very familiar with the law. But, the, but just to go back to your question about whether or not he should, uh, a politician should run an agency like that, um, well, you know, not to hold it up an example, but, you know, right now Dan, Dan Coates is running the national, the, uh, the, the NSA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's not saying it's a good thing, but I think that right now there's no question that the FBI has been somewhat politicized. And to have somebody in that position who understands the political game and can really be involved and can really make sure that people are being heard and respect that right now this is going to be a very political position for a while, that's not a bad thing. Do you think from a character standpoint uh, that Joe Lieberman, you know, obviously the story right now is that Donald Trump is asking all his FBI candidates to pledge loyalty to him. Is that something that you think that Joe Lieberman would fall in line, in line with? with? I, I ever, having known him my entire life, I can say with all whatever personal authority I have that there's no way that Joe Lieberman would ever pledge, pledge loyalty to anybody. 
Joe, Joe Lieberman is an Orthodox Jew. Joe, Joe Lieberman has a very strong connection with God. I've prayed with him more times than I've prayed with anybody else in my life. This is somebody who really is moral. This is somebody who has a personal connection to a higher power and, and, and feels it very, very sincerely. Um, he could never pledge loyalty to somebody. Um, he, he was the first member of the party to condemn Clinton um, when, you know, after Lewinsky. Right. You know, he, that's just not the way he works. So basically what you're saying is that Joe Lieberman not pledging loyalty, he has no, no chance of becoming FBI director then. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I can't, certainly can't get into Trump's head, and I don't want to be there. Right. <laughs> Seems um, like a terrible place to you'd be. You'd have to get through a lot the of hair. stuff going on. But I on. think, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm Donald Trump, I think that Joe Lieberman is probably a relatively safe pick in the sense of he's somebody who has um, – who would be acceptable to a lot of Democrats. He would probably get, con- get confirmed. Right. And I think you need that confirmation. Right. Um, and I think that he can count on during that confirmation hearing Joe being very – intelligent, very balanced, really winning people over. Um, and I think that if you really get inside Trump's head, I don't know if he necessarily needs fealty or fidelity from whoever's the FBI director. Jill, uh, um, Donald Trump thinks he's innocent. Right. You know, and so he, I think if he, that he probably thinks someone like Joe who's just going to do a good, you know, stable job is going to vindicate me. Right. Um, which I don't believe anybody would be able to vindicate him unless right. they were a hack and Joe's not a hack. Well, that's good to know. We'll definitely be watching to see the president I know wants to make it's a, a scary decision. job. I don't know who would want that. I mean, even if it was if it was offered to me, I'd be like, oh, no, no. With yeah. the FBI job? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what a that's sticky why I said. place that's why to four be. People, that's why four people have dropped out. Well, and, it, uh, it's, he, it's a 10-year appointment. You have an awful lot of resources. I mean, you have... You know, one thing that's really ten point ten year unless you're Comey. You know what's really interesting is the the right. FBI building in Washington is across the street from the from the FEC building, the FEC that's the Federal Elections Committee. It's this little townhouse that's you know, and then the FBI is like an entire block. And I think it's just a very interesting statement about America, where you've got this little tiny building with this very small budget that's in charge of keeping our elections clean and safe, right. and you've got the FBI, which is which is about laws that is. 100 times larger and more powerful. Which I'm glad you brought up the FEC because the FEC is really wanting Robert Mueller to ramp up this investigation and, and wrap I hope it up because they, they are so doing that. So just to conclude the point, the FBI has tremendous power and tremendous influence in terms of making this country a safer place. There's a lot of laws that enforce that have real impact on our lives. Right. A lot of investigation a difference. And yeah, I think that anybody who's really dedicated to public service and it may be attracted to the FBI, and I know Joe is. Well, thanks right. for all of that. You're welcome. That's very good. I'm always glad to have you back. You're going to have to come on again so we can talk more about, especially once the Supreme Court starts handing down these rulings uh, next month. I'll come back whenever um, you guys want. We didn't get a chance to talk about uh, California Convention this weekend. Uh, but, oh, no. Uh, that's okay. Congrats to Eric Bauman, who's the new chair, and all the new vice chairs, the male vice chair and female vice chair. Uh, the new secretary and the new controller. Were you impressed? Were did you like this week? Were you too inspired? And by what I thought it what was, was your I thought feel? it was a it was a really great weekend. I think the biggest takeaway is obviously you know this is the first big test after the big primary last year, and uh, one of the things that I have been telling people is is that once we got down to the actual like once we got past the chairs race, uh, which came down to like sixty votes, um, when it came down to resolutions. There was z- very little daylight in between where California Democrats stood on big issues like single payer X, Y, and Z, um, fracking, and all this other stuff. So I think that's what the that's what the goal should always be, and that's why I talk a lot about the Democrats not focusing on a person and focusing on the ideas, because at the end of the day, when it comes down to the resolutions and where we stand we're always on the same page and i think that's that's what i saw out of the three thousand almost three thousand delegates that were in there today chanting the exact same thing um we got sb6562 that's coming to the floor single pair it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit trouble because about 400 billion dollars of california money and 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 i know the senators are still trying to figure out where that money's going to come from but that in theory everybody's on the same page and and I just thought it was a really like Kamala Harris was there Kevin DeLeon who's probably going to run for governor was there Anthony Rennan Maxine Waters Barbara Lee get, wow you Gavin were in your Newsom. happy place I was I, I met Xavier <laughs> Bassara who's the attorney general so there was a lot it was a it was like Politicon that's coming up 
Oh, geez. In July. Which uh, I which saw we're all going about to. Ann Coulter Tommy and Tommy Lauren. Yep. I was like, what back, are you making back, me go to? They've been back. Um, hey, if you're in Los Angeles, I'm actually uh, leaving the studio and I'm going to be judging the LA Pride Comedy Festival uh, here in just about an hour. Um, so come out today and tomorrow. Check it out. Um, and if you can, you can just join Festival. me over on After Buzz TV the, the for the Trump, Trump report. report. Yes, go see the Trump Report. Um, we're going to be talking about the budget, like I said, next week. Uh, so we got a lot to unpack. Um, and uh, you can follow me Whatever on Whatever else madness comes up between now and then, Hopefully, which we sure there will be. Yes, 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 yes. We'll give you all the latest on some of the stuff that we talked about today, too. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Drexel Heard. And me at Chelsea Galicia. Roger, where can they follow you? Roger underscore Wolfson. That's right. And you can uh, <laughs> follow us on Afterbuzz. Follow us on Afterbuzz, uh, ABTV Polyculture yeah. on Twitter so we can have more followers and then we can retweet all of you guys. Uh, have a great week, guys. We will see you next week. Bye. From executives Kevin Undergaro, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us. Info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at BHL Online. And I am the official voice of Black Hollywood Live, Scipio, Instagram at KingXO Bay. Thanks for tuning in. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.